Hi, this video is titled Doing Data Science, which I will be the first one to admit is a little bit vague, but what I hope to get across in this video to you is how we start thinking about formulating a data science project. How do we pose questions and how do we go about starting to answer them? So what is in a data analysis? Here's an excerpt from a book called The Art of Data Science uh, by Roger Peng and Elizabeth Matsui, and they've listed the five core activities of data analysis as follows. Starting and refining the question, exploring the data, building formal statistical models, interpreting the results, and communicating the results. This is exactly what we're going to be asking you to do as part of your uh, project uh, by the end of the semester, but we also acknowledge that as of today, you have not really learned all of the steps of this, um, but you have uh, gotten a chance to kind of get a taste of bits and pieces of it and have gotten to do a lot more extensive work on some of the other pieces. So then how do we think about starting to formulate a data analysis project as of today when we haven't gone through the entire course yet? Um, so let's think about the first step, stating and refining the question. There are six types of questions that we might think about. Uh, descriptive questions, exploratory questions, inferential questions, predictive questions, causal questions, and mechanistic questions. And this is uh, coming from a paper by Jeff Leake and Roger Pang uh, called What is the Question? So let's think about what these are. Descriptive means where we are summarizing char uh, a characteristic of a set data. So you have some sample data and you're basically summarizing its characteristics. Exploratory analysis would be seeing, analyzing to see if there are patterns, trends, or relationships between variables. And this is the point where based on your exploratory analysis, you might be generating some hypotheses about your data. Inferential would mean analyzing patterns, trends, or relationships in representative data from a population. And that representative is important to underscore here because if you want to be able to uh, draw some conclusions based off of your data and generalize it to the um, population at large, it needs to be representative data. So you need to know about how that data was collected. Predictive means making predictions for individuals or groups of individuals. Causal would mean whether changing one factor will change another factor on average in a population. And mechanistic is about exploring how as opposed to whether. So your project could fall into really any one of these. Although um, if I, if, uh, when we evaluate your project proposals, if we feel that it's stuck a little bit too much in the descriptive area, we would at least push you towards the exploratory. And this is not necessarily a ladder of excellence. It doesn't necessarily mean that predictive questions are better questions than exploratory questions, but it is true the amount of uh, statistical methodology uh, you would need to use is like kind of higher for the higher end of this than the lower ones. Your project assignment for the course simply says pick a data set and do something with it. It doesn't say pick a data set and do something inferential with it or predictive with it. Um, but depending on the question that you're posing, we'll try to guide you as we evaluate your project proposal into one of these categories and most definitely out of the first category at a minimum. So let's give a concrete example of these six types of questions in the context of COVID-19 and vitamin D. You may have seen in the news that uh, researchers are investigating links between uh, vitamin D intake and reduced risk of hospitalizations due to COVID-19. So how would these six questions look like in this context? A descriptive question would be something along the lines of frequency of hospitalizations due to COVID-19 in a set of data collected from a group of individuals. Um, an exploratory question would go a step further and examine the relationships between a range of dietary factors and COVID-19 hospitalizations. An inferential question would examine whether any relationship between taking vitamin D supplements and COVID-19 hospitalizations found in the sample hold for the population at large. Um, a predictive question might be something like what types of people will take vitamin D supplements during the next year? And a causal question would be about whether people with COVID-19 who are randomly assigned to take vitamin D supplements or those who are not uh, are hospitalized. And a mechanistic question might go about exploring how increased vitamin D intake leads to a reduction in the number of viral illnesses. 
We can imagine working with data to answer any one of these questions, and they're all very related to each other, but the uh, type of methods you would use to answer them and also the type of data that you would need to answer them uh, vary greatly. So when you have a data science problem in hand, there are a few questions you want to ask to this problem. Do you have appropriate data to answer your question? Do you have information on confounding variables? Was the data you're working with collected in a way that introduces bias? Let's take a look at this question. Suppose I want to estimate the average number of children in households in Edinburgh. I conduct a survey at an elementary school in Edinburgh and ask students at this elementary school how many children, including themselves, live in the house. Then I take the average of the responses is this a biased or an unbiased estimate of the number of children in households in Edinburgh? And if biased, will the value be an overestimate or an underestimate? I'll give you a second to think about that. Pause the video if you need, and the answer is coming up shortly. So we're collecting data from an elementary school. Kids go to elementary school. But the question is about average number of children in households in Edinburgh, not average number of children in households with children in Edinburgh. So the minimum that we can get from the elementary school is a number one. But if we were to actually take a sample of all houses in Edinburgh, the minimum we would get is a number zero. There are some households with no children in them. So this is going to be a biased sample because of where, how we collected the data. And Hence, it's going to yield a biased estimate. And will this be an overestimate or an underestimate? Since we're not getting any of those zeros, the average we find is going to be an overestimate of the tree number. So this is the sort of thing you want to think about when you find some data. You might come across some interesting data for your project, but you want to ask these three questions. Do you have the appropriate data to answer your question? Do you have information on confounding variables? And was the data you're working with collected in a way that introduces bias? During the proposal stage, we want you to answer these questions. And as a feedback for the proposal, if we sense that you're not on the right track with any of these questions, we'll give you that feedback so that you're not heading down the wrong path for your final project. Um, we also, as part of your project proposal, we want you to do a little bit of exploratory data analysis because just finding the data set and then saying, all right, I'm going to do something with this is often not good enough because it, um, you might want to, uh, you might actually discover something interesting during this exp exploratory stage, or you might discover nothing interesting, which might be informative, telling you that perhaps this is not the right data set for you to be working with for this project. So your checklist for what you want to do for this phase is you want to formulate your question, read in your data, check its dimensions, look at the top and the bottom of your data, validate with at least one external data source, maybe make a plot, and try some easy solution first to see where you get. So in formulating your question, the first thing you want to do is consider this scope. Uh, for example, are air pollution levels higher on the East Coast than on the West Coast? Or are hourly ozone levels av on average higher in New York City than they are in Los Angeles? Or do counties in the eastern United States have a higher ozone levels than counties in the western United States? These are three different scopes um, about all about air pollution. But the way to answer these, the data required to answer them and the methods required to answer them are going to be slightly different. So most importantly, the question you want to ask yourself is with some data you may have found, which one of these questions can you answer, if any? Do I have the right data to answer the question I just formulated? That's a big chunk of what the project proposal stage is about. Then you want to read in your data. We want you to place your data in a folder called data in your project repository that each of the teams will have access to. Then we want you to read it in to R with read underscore CSV or friends, some of the other functions that we learned for reading data in and take a look at it. You know, we want you to read it just to make sure that the file is incorrupt, that it's actually readable. And maybe you will find out that you found an interesting data set, but you don't yet know how to read such a data set into R because it comes in a different format than what we've encountered. 
this is a good time to ask the question. If it's a straightforward answer, we might just give you the function and say, all right, you can use it for your project. Maybe it won't be super straightforward, but we might say, hey, if you're willing to do a little bit of extra work, you can do it and you can decide whether you want to or not. Or maybe the answer will be, this whole thing is going to be more complicated that you, than you might want to get into. Hence, we would recommend finding a different data set. That's the sort of thing you want to know now as opposed to in week 10. Um, once you read the data in, if the variable names are malformatted, um, not in snake case, not kind of abiding by the other coding style rules that we've talked about in this class, go ahead and clean those names with functions we've learned like janitors clean names, just so when you look at your data set, you can start thinking about what your analysis, uh, what your analysis code is going to start looking like. Um, so here's a very uh, brief case study of formulating one of these questions. And we're going to look at data uh, on squirrels from um, New York City. So the Squirrel Census is a multimedia science design and storytelling project uh, focusing on the Eastern Gray uh, squirrel. So they count squirrels and present their findings to the public. Um, the table that the data set that we're working with uh, contains data for 3,023 sightings, including location, coordinates, age, primary and secondary fur color, elevation, activities, communications, and interaction between uh, squirrels and humans from uh, Central Park in New York City. Um, so if you want to take a look at the code book, um, I have linked it here. The data uh, lives in an R package. Um, the data was released publicly, so I just placed it in an R package. Uh, so we can take a look at the um, code here. You wanna make sure that there's a code book like this available to you that comes with your data. Obviously, there's no expectation that your data is in a package. It probably won't be, uh, but you wanna make sure that there is a code book available and that will be part of your project to construct that code book in a way where um, it's useful for others as well. You wanna check the dimensions. The description said 3,023 sightings, and in fact, that's how many rows we have, and we have 35 variables for each one of these uh, sightings. Look at the top of your data. The head function is useful for that. It will print out the first six rows for you. Just take a look to see if there's anything bizarre going on. And look at the bottom of your data as well. Sometimes the top of a data file can be super clean and then something bizarre might be ha happening at the bottom. So the tail function is helpful for that. Um, you also want to validate with at least one external uh, data source. So in our data set, we had some latitude and longitude data for squirrel sightings in what was told to be Central Park, Google Central Park. Are those the coordinates um, for the uh, for Central Park? Do these appear to be in Central Park or do they appear to be in an entirely different country, for example? So some sort of validation like this can be incredibly helpful uh, just to make sure that if there is some egregious error or something bizarre happening with your data, you can catch it as early as possible. Then make some plots. So here we have a plot of the squirrel sightings. We've used a uh, low alpha level. So when there's over plotting, we know that there are more sightings there. Uh, some of the areas you're seeing are completely empty. Uh, Central Park has this rectangular shape. That's why we're seeing that. And the empty areas are probably like the wooded or the lake area. So the more there are humans, the more likely that um, a sighting was actually recorded. So this is not so much about where the squares live, but about where they were sighted by humans. So looking at this, maybe at this exploratory stage, you might start to start forming a hypothesis. Let's suppose that the hypothesis I form here is that there will be a higher density of sightings on the perimeter than inside the park. Maybe thinking that, well, to be inside the park, you have to deliberately go inside the park, but those who are in the park and also those who are walking by the park may have recorded sightings. Um, so maybe we would see more around the edges. If this is our hypothesis, what might we do to start exploring it? Try the easy solution first. Here, I've simply colored the points from that same previous uh, plot that we were looking at uh, with uh, one color for inside and one on the perimeter. So I've taken a look to see um, if that's um, on the inside or in the perimeter. So we were basically looking to uh, deciding this with an if else statement, uh, depending on the coordinates. 
and um taking a look to see does there seem to be a lot more of them there than on the inside i might also make a table for this to take a look at that if it's not very clear from your easy solution uh you might then decide to go deeper so here we know that we have lots and lots of sighting so maybe that um plot with the low alpha level is not really still telling us a whole lot but we've learned about um hexpin plot so maybe we actually uh kind of aggregate our data in a hexpin plot and uh look to see are we seeing more of these what would be lighter blue colors around the edges or not the answer seems to be no so maybe my hypothesis was not correct um or maybe it is uh maybe i do i do feel strongly about it and i want to investigate it further i would probably want to present some reason why that is the case or i might move on to generating a different hypothesis so this level of exploration is what we're looking for from you at the project proposal stage Actually answering the questions you formulate is going to uh, remain until the end of the course when you've learned a lot more about modeling as well, uh, about modeling and inference. Uh, but for now, we want you to at least explore the data to little bit, a little bit to see what might be some interesting questions you could answer with the data you have. Um, you might also then start looking at your data in its raw format a little bit. So here, for example, we have... Um, one person who noted he took two steps and then turned and stared at me about one of the uh, squirrels this happens to be a kind of a fun data set to browse through a little bit um but whatever data set you find we don't necessarily expect you to comb through every single row of it that's why we, we have the whole class to begin with to be able to analyze data um without having to look through every single row but it is useful especially if there is a column like notes or comments to look through that to see if there's something you want to be paying attention to um so ultimately the your communication uh for it, it needs to be tailored to your audience and so for the audience for this project uh your audience is your fellow classmates and us so we want you to uh think about a few things avoid jargon uninterpreted results and lengthy output nobody wants to look through pages and pages of output nobody will look through pages and pages of output um if you have results uh they need to be interpreted we're not going to take a look at your output and kind of try to make sense of it ourselves and jargon is also useful to interpret jargon sometimes simply means uh keywords that you've learned in the class in which sense you need to be using them but over usage of jargon is never a good idea in writing your communication you should pay attention to your organization, your presentation, and your flow, and we'll have uh, created your repositories for you, organized in a certain way, so that uh, in order to help you. And in terms of what the flow and the presentation of your final project will look like, we still have the entire second half of the uh, class to build up to that, and we'll give you a lot more information about it. Don't forget about things like code style, coding best practices, and making meaningful commits, especially when you're working on a larger scale project with others. And be open to suggestions, feedback, and taking calculated risks. We don't want you to take wild risks and find yourself in a situation where you're unable to kind of complete the project in time. But do try to be a little bit adventurous if you feel like there's something worth exploring, but it requires a particular technique or a package um, we haven't learned in the class. Think about whether you feel comfortable taking that risk and asking questions about it, obviously, during student hours and also on Piazza to get the support you need in order to be able to work with them. 